Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to brave the, the squalls and storms of Liverpool this afternoon. This afternoon we have great, great privilege of having John Chisholm talking to us. Those of you with any connection to general practice will know the name and would have seen the photograph of John many times. John was of course the chairman of the BMA General Practice Committee and was responsible for negotiating the latest GP contract, the 2004 contract, for which he no doubt still bears the scars, but um, the, uh, the profession were quite happy to pocket the money. John had an illustrious career in GPC and then he's more recently gone on to a completely different role in BMA. He still, he still has a political role. He's, he, like me, is on BMA Council, where he can be relied upon to speak words of wisdom, which I have to say is not always the case for all uh, council members. Um, but his role as the, the chairman of the BMA Ethics Committee is, is a really important one. The BMA, of course, has two roles. One is as a trade union, which the, which the BBC like to highlight um, at the moment to, to try to undermine us. And the other is as a professional association. And it's the professional association side which gives us a lot of credibility when it comes to the, to the trade union side. And as I, as I said last week, we, through the Charities Committee, had um, supported uh, a project which will get national publicity of a very favourable kind. And in the same way, the efforts of John and his colleagues on the Ethics Committee and their secretariat, who are extremely expert, um, gives us a lot of credibility. And so when there is a medical ethical problem, it will be to John or a member of the Ethics Committee Secretariat that the press turn. And there is an enormous amount of work involved in this. It, it isn't just being titular head of a, a committee, because unlike most committees, <laughs> ethics is changing all the time and the challenges of ethics change all the time. Just this afternoon coming down in the car, I heard that that the fertility unit in Newcastle has been licensed to use um, DNA from two, from three, um, from three gametes um, in fertility work. And this is the sort of issue that the Ethical Committee deals with all the time. John is meticulous. Um, he is a note taker par excellence, has filled rooms in his house with notes, totally meticulous. However, he does tell the story of the one time that he wasn't quite as meticulous. And this was a number of years ago when he was travelling on BMA business uh, from London, I think to Edinburgh by plane, and he turned up at the, uh, the airport and was met with the request for his passport. And this was at the very early stage of having to give it identification, and of course he hadn't got it with him. But he had a brilliant idea, so he whipped out his newspaper, which was that day's Times, with his photograph on the front page. So there we go, Times is a, is a, is a newspaper of record. Well, not for easy, yes, it wasn't, so we had to make alternative arrangements. John, can I ask you to, to address the other line? Thank you. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, Eric. It's a great pleasure to be back in Liverpool. I've been to Liverpool a number of times at BMA annual meetings and also at Royal College of GPs annual conferences. And of course, my uh, friend and colleague and mentor, uh, Ian Bogle, was famously from Liverpool and indeed partner of Pam um, and 
Ian was immensely kind to me when I worked with him on the uh, GP negotiating team when he was the chair of the uh, General Practitioners Committee. And um, one of the more recent times that I was back in Liverpool was sadly for Ian's funeral in the uh, cathedral. But anyway, it's lovely to be here, although when I looked it up on BBC Weather this morning, it said it was going to be dry in Liverpool today. And, um, somebody has had alternative plans in the weather, obviously. Anyway, on we go. This is an outline of what I'm going to talk about this evening. A little bit about ethical decision making. And then I'm going to touch on five current issues and conclude by talking a little bit about the work of the BMA's Medical Ethics Committee and the Medical Ethics and Human Rights Department and particularly what they can do to help you if you need their expert advice. So what are medical ethics? There are loads of definitions that uh, one could come up with, but uh, the BMA is practically focused and um, is keen to give uh, people advice, uh, either specifically when they need it or advice that's available to them at any time about the standards of professional competence and conduct which are to be expected of us as practicing doctors. There are uh, lots of uh, key concepts that um, lie uh, within the field of medical ethics and here are uh, a few. Uh, autonomy, uh, the ability of uh, us as patients and our patients to make the choices they wish to make. Obviously, honesty and integrity lie at the core of our professional practice and confidentiality lies at the heart of the relationship of trust between doctor and patient. Also, justice, fairness, equity are major components and when we are looking at an ethical issue, uh, a, an assessment of harms and benefits of different courses of action has to be uh, embarked on. So here are some flow charts that have uh, kindly been prepared by the Medical Ethics Department um, about how we <coughs> might approach uh, a, an ethical dilemma. And I would say that the BMA is very focused on getting doctors who seek its advice to think through an issue and to analyse competing options so as to decide how to proceed. And that's informed and guided by the BMA's knowledge of the law, of uh, guidance uh, from the GMC and other professional bodies, and also by BMA policy and opinion. So, first of all, often a doctor will be coming to the BMA having recognised that he or she is in a situation that raises a dilemma. And in discussion with members of the uh, BMA Ethics Secretariat, uh, the doctor will be helped to try to break that dilemma down uh, the uh, member of uh, staff at the BMA will ask um, for additional information from the doctor, uh, including uh, what the views of the patient are, and will also be able to identify relevant legal and professional guidance. And all of that may lead the doctor um, along a path of thinking that the issue is resolved and being able to justify the decision that has been reached with an underpinning of sound arguments. But 
that's um, not always the case. And so then further critical analysis will be needed and hopefully that will resolve the issue, but not always. And if it isn't, then it may be that there is a, a difficult conflict that uh, you know, not, not, not every question has certainly not a single answer, but also um, sometimes not a clear answer. And sometimes there will be circumstances where it's actually necessary uh, to uh, go to court to actually resolve the issue. And that can uh, be more likely to occur if there are disagreements within the clinical team or disagreements between the clinicians and the patient or the patient's relatives. Now, there are a variety of approaches that um, can be used in medical ethics. Uh, it encompasses a number of philosophical approaches. Um, this slide's about utilitarianism, which is an ethical theory that the best action is the one that maximizes utility. And uh, Jeremy Bentham, who uh, founded utilitarianism, and is hidden in the cupboard in University College, not far from um, BMA House in London, um, described utility as the sum of all pleasure that results from an action minus the suffering of anyone involved in the action. Utilitarianism is essentially a version of consequentialism the consequences of any action are considered to be the only standard of right and wrong. Another approach much favoured in uh, continental Europe is uh, deontology, which judges the morality of an action based on rules. It's sometimes described as duty or obligation or rule-based ethics. And uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, the uh, German philosopher, uh, argued that uh, to act in the morally right way, people must act from duty and that it isn't the consequences of an action that makes them right or wrong, but the motives of the person who carries out the action. The four principles approach is uh, now a common framework that's used in the analysis of medical ethics and often taught to students in medical schools. It was postulated originally by Tom Beecham and James Childress uh, in the States and its leading UK advocate is Ranan Gillen and Ra is one of the eight appointed experts on the BMA's Medical Ethics Committee. Unusually uh, for BMA committees, a substantial part of its membership are um, uh, people from outside the medical profession, although it, as it happens, Ra is uh, a doctor as well as a philosopher. But the other um, external members have backgrounds in philosophy or medical ethics or the law or theology or religion, and they bring an enormous richness of uh, input to our deliberations. But also there are on the uh, committee 10 doctors who bring their practical experience of ethical dilemmas in their uh, clinical practice into the committee. Anyway, the four basic moral principles of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and justice are to be applied to a situation judged and weighed against each other. This is a slide from uh, Julian Sheva, who's the deputy head of the uh, medical ethics department at the BMA, and it really summarises the thought that ethical dilemmas can be challenging and exhilarating, and in some ways 
the more difficult they are, the more illuminating they can be. Uh, a, a difficulty is a light, but an insurmountable difficulty is a sun. Now, the first of the current issues that I wanted to talk about um, is confidentiality. And there are three issues going on at the moment um, that are in total uh, taken together pretty worrying. Now, uh, those of you who are in general practice will probably know more about the type 1 opt-out than those of you who are in hospital medicine because um, since the Health and Social Care Act was passed into law five years ago, that was the act that was inflicted on the NHS um, uh, as the brainchild of Andrew Lansley and has been really an unremitting problem. Um, anyway, one of the provisions of the Health and Social Care Act is that there is an obligation on healthcare providers to share information with NHS Digital at the request of the Secretary of State for Health or NHS England. And round about the same time, there was a proposal uh, called Care.Data, which would have sucked out of um, uh, the health service um, uh, an enormous uh, amount of data which then could be used for uh, potentially uh, beneficial purposes but there were a lot of concerns about uh, care.data. Um, some of you may have um, watched the uh, interesting um, film of uh, Hitler's last days in the bunker, which was dubbed uh, by Sir David Nicholson. Uh, well, I, I don't think he actually did it personally, but, but nonetheless, this was putting words into the mouth of Tim Kelsey, who was then the head of information at um, uh, NHS England and a great enthusiast for care.data. And he was dubbed uh, as Hitler, and the, the video of his enthusiasm for care.data was then uh, promulgated via Twitter and other ways uh, by Sir David Nicholson uh, in his uh, dog days as um, chief executive um, of NHS England, which made out cause a, a bit of a, a rumpus back at the ranch. Um, anyway. One of the uh, outcomes of the fuss about care.data was that Jeremy Hunt allowed something called type 1 opt-out, which meant that a patient who was unhappy about his or her uh, data leaving um, the general practice and being shared with NHS Digital could exercise um, uh, the type 1 opt-out and prevent the data leaving. The National Data Guardian, um, Dame uh, Fiona Caldicott, uh, is now recommending a single opt-out at NHS digital level, which is similar to the current type 2 opt-out, where basically the data are sucked out of general practices and hospitals and collected at NHS digital, uh, but uh, those patients who wish can say they don't want their data being shared beyond NHS Digital. Um, at the moment, 1.6 million people have exercised a type 1 opt-out and 1.2 million have exercised a type 2 opt-out. So the level of concern about threats to confidentiality is by no means small amongst the general population. And of course, uh, there will be many more people who would be concerned about those threats if they understood them. So if 
Dame Fiona Caldercott's uh, recent report is accepted by the government, then the type one opt-out would be removed and that would restrict the choices that patients had and potentially would have a deleterious effect on the relationship of trust between patients and doctors and potentially uh, affect how they consulted, uh, whether they consulted at all, and what they disclosed to uh, uh, their general practitioners and to other clinicians. Uh, because in that relationship of trust, obviously there's an enormous amount of intimate information uh, about domestic violence or uh, about child safeguarding issues um, that uh, people really do not wish to be widely known about. So that's the first of the three current threats. The second is a threat to the concept of NHS Digital, which is what used to be called the Health and Social Care Information Centre, being a safe haven. It was um, set up uh, as a so-called safe haven. And obviously the public relies on NHS Digital keeping the information it holds safe and confidential. Uh, and uh, it should only release data either with consent or when there is uh, a public interest in disclosure. Uh, and there are situations <coughs> uh, in law and uh, in other situations that are accepted as reasonable by the GMC and the DMA where uh, uh, information can be disclosed in the public interest to protect individuals or others from risks of serious harm and to prevent or detect serious crime. Now recently it's become apparent that NHS Digital is using a lower threshold to release information to the Home Office, particularly uh, in order to uh, trace uh, people who may have committed immigration offences. And that's very far below the threshold of uh, serious crime uh, defined in the GMC's guidance. And Kingsley Manning, who until recently was the chair of NHS Digital, spoke on the Today programme a few weeks ago, uh, saying that NHS Digital had been put under immense pressure to release confidential data to the government. And that situation is a clear breach of the second data protection principle that personal data shall be obtained only for one or more specified and lawful purposes and shall not be further processed in any manner incompatible with that purpose or those purposes. The third of the current threats to confidentiality is a bill that's going through Parliament at the moment called the Digital Economy Bill. And that includes some very broad information sharing powers. At the moment, those powers uh, do not apply to health and social care, but they could be um, uh, included in the future if regulations were uh, passed through Parliament uh, so that uh, other public bodies would be added to the very long list of uh, public bodies that are currently included, um, including NHS Digital and Hospital Trusts and General Practices. And that would then mean that the government could access all those data without consent or consideration of the common law public interest threshold, uh, the bill would quite specifically, uh, by a provision in one of its clauses, override the common law duty of confidentiality, including medical confidentiality. And again, that would be uh, a breach of the second data protection principle, but this bill, if it becomes an act, would trump the Data Protection Act.
The second area of um, current issues that I wanted to touch on is to do with the decriminalisation of abortion. Now, abortion remains a crime in the UK, um, governed by the Offences Against the Person Act 1861 and the Infant Life Preservation Act 1929. There are differences in law between the four countries of the UK, with the law being much more restrictive, in particular in Northern Ireland, and with Scotland being um, governed largely by um, the uh, common law rather than by statute law. Um, so I'm going to focus largely on uh, England and Wales in, in what I say. But the Abortion Act 1967, the 50th anniversary of which falls this year, uh, is an exception to the position of abortion being a crime. Because abortion is a crime, there have been several uh, criminal prosecutions and some women have purpose purposefully exposed themselves to the risk of prosecution and there have been some uh, attempts um, uh, by newspapers and others to seek the prosecution of some doctors authorising or carrying out abortions. So the cases where <coughs> um, uh, prosecutions have taken place or been considered fall into uh, those areas that are listed on the slide and I won't go through all of those but they uh, include people who have been encouraging others, uh, they include women who have um, uh, procured and uh, self-administered abortifacients and they have included doctors who've been challenged for uh, being involved in providing abortions or carrying out abortions that they deem to be lawful. On the specific issue of decriminalisation, which was debated in Parliament um, briefly earlier this week, um, and I think is an issue that is moving up the uh, political and public agenda, the BMA currently has no policy, but it was asked to look at the issue at last year's annual representative meeting in Belfast. And that's why the Medical Ethics Committee has been developing a factual discussion paper about decriminalisation. Um, and one of the members of staff of the department, Rebecca Mussel, has taken the lead in producing that paper. <clears throat> and one of the things that it points out is that the term decriminalisation is pretty vague and that people need to be more specific in saying what they mean um, uh, by uh, decriminalisation. Do they want to remove the criminal law entirely? Do they want to um, remove the uh, criminal law, but then actually introduce new legislation to recriminalise certain uh, uh, actions? Or do they want to um, remove part of the law, but keep other existing parts of the law? Um, and because this discussion paper has recently been circulated to the representatives who attend the BMA's annual policy making meeting, it is probable that there will be motions submitted for debate and it's possible that out of those motions will come policy. Those of you who have ever been to one of those meetings will know that over the course of four days roughly 120 topics are debated and if motions are passed then uh, those become BMA policy but if they are rejected no policy at all is made so uh, the mere fact that motions may be debated doesn't mean 
that there will be new policy uh, at all. We'll have to wait and see. The discussion paper, um, amongst other um, matters, sets out a variety of arguments that others have proposed for decriminalisation and also sets out uh, uh, an equal number of arguments that others have used against decriminalisation and uh, the arguments are uh, finely weighted and the paper very deliberately takes no stance. But it does ask some questions um, and these are the questions that are posed. There are obviously many other questions that one uh, uh, could pose, um, but one of them, the first, uh, uh, addresses uh, women who uh, self-administer an abortion and that is obviously becoming a much more frequent possibility given the ready availability of drugs via the internet. Um, so this is, if you like, a new problem that didn't exist when the 1967 Abortion Act was introduced and when almost all abortions were surgical rather than medical abortions. And the second question also uh, deals with <coughs> Uh, that area. And the third area, uh, the third question there, um, uh, separates the women who are uh, seeking an abortion uh, and the people who supply the drugs that may enable that. And the fourth question is in a different area, which is to do with uh, the possibility of criminal prosecution. For example, at the moment, uh, it is a criminal offence if uh, doctors are late submitting the forms that are required by uh, the, the law uh, in relation to the approval of an abortion. Um, so there's a debate to be had about the extent to which actions by doctors should or should not be criminalised. And the final question there is about the relevance or irrelevance of the point of viability of a uh, pregnancy. And obviously that is a moving um, uh, position uh, as uh, medical care and research improve the possibility of um, uh, helping uh, extremely premature babies to survive and to survive uh, uh, more healthily than might have been the case in the past. The third area, uh, uh, the third current issue that I wanted to uh, talk about was uh, end of life care. The BMA had um, a very substantial project over the best part of two years uh, into uh, end of life care and physician assisted dying. Uh, and um, although this was uh, a project that involved the whole of the BMA, it was particularly led by uh, Veronica English, the head of the medical ethics department, and one of her colleagues, Ruth Campbell. Um, and uh, it's not exaggerating to say it pretty well took over their lives for um, those couple of years. Uh, anyway, um, it began by uh, a proposal from uh, BMA Council, and uh, it was very much focused on exploring what both doctors and patients thought about these uh, difficult issues. Uh, and the aim was uh, to publish uh, some documents and to have uh, 
some debates at last year's annual meeting, uh, uh, one of which was an open debate that was facilitated by Michael Burke of the uh, BBC Moral Maze. Um, and to uh, refine policy and then as a result of those uh, policies uh, to lobby for improvements in uh, end-of-life care. And in order to hear the views of doctors and the public, um, uh, some uh, experts in social research called TNS were commissioned to conduct a series of dialogue events and there were 21 of those and um, 237 doctors participated and 269 members of the public and the topics that were discussed included doctor-patient relationships, hopes, fears and concerns about end-of-life care and about death, um, perceptions and experiences of end-of-life care, both from doctors and from uh, members of the public who had uh, experienced uh, care through their relatives. Um, doctors' own experiences of being providers of care, and then also how, if there was a change uh, in the law, uh, that made physician-assisted dying a possibility in the UK, how that would impact on the doctor-patient relationship. Those are um, images of the uh, three uh, weighty reports that were produced as um, an output of the project. <laughs> on end-life care, there were three um, overarching themes. Um, one of them was about variability in the quality of end-of-life care and in access to high-quality end-of-life care. A second major theme was about a need for improved education, training and support for doctors. And that support included emotional support for uh, doctors and indeed other members of the healthcare team uh, because uh, end of life care can be extremely um, emotionally challenging. And the third overarching theme that emerged was about the role of families. And <clears throat> this was almost the only area um, where there were very significant differences in uh, the perception of doctors and uh, the public, uh, that this was an issue, the well-being of family members, that was identified as being a really major priority by uh, members of the public, but was something that doctors by and large, didn't touch on much when they were talking in the dialogue events. So this is a slide about uh, what good end-of-life care uh, looks like uh, for the public. Uh, the public made points about uh, location, about communication, information, coordination, emotional support, medical services, and help with financial and legal issues. And um, <clears throat> just to pick out a few, um, obviously open and honest communication is hugely important, as is coordination of care um, and the suggestion that there might be a single uh, coordinator of care to whom people could turn and the need for emotional support and for that support to continue after the patient's death to continue to be available to relatives and how of course that can be a difficult issue uh, to coordinate and organise given the fact that 
the relatives may live elsewhere or may live locally but be registered with a different general practice and there are all sorts of practical and logist logistical issues in delivering that necessary objective. So <clears throat> there are challenges in providing what the public want um, that um, there uh, is often inadequate planning, uh, there are often difficulties in out-of-hours care, doctors often feel insufficiently uh, confident about uh, communication, uh, doctors are very understandably under huge time pressures and other demand, face other demands that make it difficult to uh, deliver consistently high quality care. And this issue of lack of coordination uh, uh, comes back and there are issues there um, that sometimes arise between primary and secondary care. And there's a reluctance, both amongst the public and amongst some members of the medical profession, to talk about death and dying. So there are things that are difficult for doctors. They are, um, some of them, lacking in confidence about administering pain relief. And obviously that situation has, for some doctors, been compounded uh, since Shipman. Um, and uh, the, the post shipment effect, I think, is a very real issue. Um, caring for dying patients is emotionally difficult and challenging. Uh, the workload pressure I've already mentioned, the problems in coordination, and again, that lack of confidence in having difficult conversations. So, Policymakers need to prioritise end of life care. Uh, one of the uh, elected members of the BMA's Medical Ethics Committee, whom we're enormously fortunate to have as a member, is Baroness Finlay, uh, who is a uh, palliative care physician and contributes enormously to our debates, but also is able through her membership of the House of Lords to repeatedly raise these issues about the quality of end of life care and about commissioning services. And she would say, and I don't know how much this is just her pride in being from Wales, but she would say that they have got some of these things better sorted in Wales than in England. Um, and there are certainly some examples of good practice from Wales. Education, training and support, crucial. Uh, and clinicians need to be supported by the system. And, and this was uh, uh, one of the issues that very much came out when Michael Burke was doing the event at the uh, annual meeting in Belfast. The need for support mechanisms for uh, clinicians but also the need for support mechanisms for um, patients and relatives. And um, I see there's an error at the bottom of that slide. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but that's actually not, not um, saying that um, uh, doctors should sort out their own problems, it's actually saying that um, they need support in doing that. Um, uh, and also, I think, in, uh, I think this is a difference, perhaps um, to make a sweeping generalisation between specialties as to whether uh, death is seen as a failure or not, but it's, uh, it should not be. So, um, those are the findings. Uh, they may or may not um, ring true to you, uh, but you may have ideas about uh, how good end-of-life care can be delivered, how end-of-life care can be improved, and about the issues that might be prioritised, and about what the BMA could do. So, um, those are the findings. 
they may or may not um, ring true to you, uh, but you may have ideas about uh, how good end-of-life care can be delivered, how end-of-life care can be improved, and about the issues that might be prioritised, and about what the BMA could do. The second strand of that project, and the fourth area that I wanted to touch on as a current issue, and it's current in the sense that people keep on bringing private members' bills back into Parliament, although the last such bill had an enormous majority uh, against it in the House of Commons. And so I think the probability is that there now will not be any further bills in this Parliament. Uh, but I could easily be wrong because peers and MPs can always um, choose to introduce private members' bills. Um, Physician assisted dying obviously would be an enormous change from where we are because it would be uh, the involvement of doctors in the intentional uh, hastening of uh, patients' deaths. Um, and um, there are various ways in which that could happen. Um, uh, some of which are physician assisted suicide uh, and some of which um, go further and become euthanasia. And I've mentioned in passing that the, uh, the project reports do consider um, in depth what's happening in other jurisdictions. The public in the discussion events were um, more balanced in the sense of uh, the pros and cons of the impact of physician assisted dying on the uh, doctor patient relationship. But the positives are there on the left and the negatives are there on uh, the right. Um, but uh, uh, certainly there was a feeling that um, uh, physician assisted dying could uh, negatively affect relationships with doctors and could change the role and purpose of being a doctor. Although uh, uh, other members of the public saw it as potentially enabling doctors to give a different sort of help and to offer more choices. Doctors, and this is reflected in surveys of doctors uh, and repeated votes at the BMA's annual meetings, and was certainly also reflected in a detailed consultation that the Royal College of General Practitioners did uh, a few years ago, um, uh, that the majority of doctors are um, unhappy about uh, the possibility of physician assisted dying and have greater fears about the consequences of that being introduced. And the uh, negatives on the right hand side of the slide there are about increasing the fear and suspicion of doctors, harming the reputation of doctors collectively, undermining the reputation of um, the profession collectively, and affecting uh, relationships um, if doctors are um, uh, unwilling to get involved. And I think under any conceivable uh, sense in which the law might be changed, I think there's absolutely no doubt that conscientious objection would be uh, allowed. It could not be conceivable that doctors would be mandated to participate in something that for many of them completely affronted uh, their personal views. Um, <clears throat> there are various ways in which um, assisted dying could be taken forward. 
It could involve a patient's own doctor, it could involve an independent doctor, or it could involve the courts. And the impact of um, uh, that on the doctor-patient relationship and the impact in other ways uh, would depend on who was making the decision. So if there was a change in the law, um, uh, then decisions would have to be made. And it was very interesting um, in the debates at the BMA's meeting, the, the, the debate on the concept of physician-assisted dying was hugely uh, opposed to the concept. Again, that position was reiterated. But in the um, facilitated open debate that Michael Burke uh, conducted, uh, he got people to consider the hypothetical possibility of the law having changed. And there was a much more nuanced debate about the sort of safeguards and controls and checks and balances that would then be needed in that circumstance, uh, including from people who had spoken very strongly against the introduction of the concept. So um, in some ways there are perhaps similarities uh, at the very highest level uh, with what happened within the medical profession uh, in 1967 when the Abortion Act was introduced not by and large by pressure from doctors but by a decision within Parliament and then the medical profession had to adjust to that and some of us here will remember that transition. I was a medical student at the time and remember the pain and angst that was being caused to obstetricians and gynaecologists in wrestling with that change. So uh, here again are some discussion points about that issue, um, uh, about how you feel uh, that any change and maybe many years of change, uh, although it's clearly an area where public opinion is significantly different from medical opinion, uh, how that change would uh, affect us as doctors and how that change uh, could be organised to be the least worst um, option. The final area that I wanted to talk about as a current issue is about human rights. And these two slides just list the rights that the European Convention um, uh, offers us all. Um, uh, and um, there are more of them on the next slide. The reason it's a current issue is that there are proposals emanating from the government uh, or from politicians within the governing party uh, that the Human Rights Act should be abolished, that the UK should withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights, and that uh, as a consequence of that, uh, we would withdraw from being able to access the European Court of Human Rights, which is the final arbiter of uh, compliance with uh, the Convention rights. Uh, now, although this emanates from uh, the same people who are uh, enthusiastic about Brexit, it is separate from Brexit. We will not be leaving um, uh, the Convention, uh, which includes uh, uh, many countries that are outside the European Union, uh, by virtue of leaving the European Union, 
And the Human Rights Act is a separate piece of legislation that is not part of what's being called the Great Repeal Act. So these are separate issues, but they're very definitely in the political mix. And the concept of human rights is one that applies to all people, that human rights are universal, inalienable, indivisible, interdependent and interrelated. And so we need to wonder about what rights it is that opponents of the Human Rights Act would like to forego. And my suspicion is that they don't want to forego any of the rights for themselves, but that they want to take away rights from other people. Um, uh, and uh, it's my belief that uh, the state uh, in the UK should not be saying some of these rights are important and some of them aren't. Uh, and it certainly shouldn't be saying uh, some of you are entitled to uh, have rights, but some of you aren't. Uh, they are um, uh, universal rights. Um, but it certainly is the case that there are some who envisage human rights will not be universal, but some will have greater rights than others, uh, with the human rights of unpopular groups being limited. Um, the European Convention was very substantially drafted by the UK uh, and it derives from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and it describes rights that apply to all people. So I think um, that undermining human rights will reduce and damage the moral standing and authority of the UK internationally. And as the President of the UK Supreme Court has stated, democracy cannot simply mean the tyranny of the majority or oppression of any individual's fundamental rights. I think we do need to campaign to uphold these rights for all because they're essential for the protection of human dignity. The BMA has been very active in defending human rights, particularly health related human rights, for at least 35 years. Um, it defends and speaks out about human rights. Uh, it writes letters, um, which means I sign letters, uh, in response to evidence of abuses of health related human rights, such as breaches of medical neutrality. Um, it responds to cases where doctors are involved as uh, oppressors, for instance, those who are involved in false feeding or, assess, or assessing fitness for torture or capital punishment. It campaigns when doctors are themselves victims of human rights abuses, for example, doctors in Bahrain and in Turkey who have been imprisoned for treating protesters. It participates in drafting uh, WMA statements that are relevant to human rights, like the Declaration of Tokyo, the Declaration of Malta, the Declaration of Helsinki. And it produces books and reports uh, about human rights. For example, a couple of years ago, we published a report on children and young people in detention. And we are currently working on a report on immigration detention. Um, <clears throat> we've published uh, a, a number of books uh, in the area of human rights. Uh, medical Ethics Today is our um, uh, book about uh, medical ethics in general, but it touches on human rights. It's now in its third edition. Uh, the Medical Profession and Human Rights is a, a specific handbook about uh, human rights. Medicine Betrayed was about doctors' involvement in torture. Uh, and we've participated in a, a number of international bodies in um, uh, drafting the uh, report of the International Dual Loyalty Working Group in uh, drafting the Istanbul Protocol, which is about the assessment and documentation of uh, torture. 
Uh, and we've produced a number of toolkits, um, some of which are targeted on people who particularly have uh, rights-focused dilemmas, such as doctors in the armed forces and forensic physicians. The final few slides are about the work of the Medical Ethics Committee and the Medical Ethics and Human Rights Department. And I've just listed the topics that the uh, committee has considered at its meetings in the last two years. Um, this slide looks as if it's got a few weighty issues on it, but it's the first of three slides. So we haven't been entirely idle um, uh, and I, I won't go through them, uh, but it, merely to point out that they demonstrate the breadth of the issues that we wrestle with. I'll just leave it up on the screen for a moment and then I'll move on to the third slide. The work of the department is um, concentrated on delivering services and products to support doctors in their professional lives. That means giving advice both proactively but also reactively when doctors uh, ring up the BMA seeking advice. Uh, we publish advice and guidance. Uh, members of the department uh, go out and provide training to doctors, uh, to doctors who are international medical graduates coming to the UK and to medical students. We monitor and try to influence medical law. We um, campaign for changes in public policy and we defend and speak out about human rights. All of our website resources are on the publicly accessible part of the BMA website rather than on the members only section because we want those resources to be freely available to and used by everyone, including the public and patients. Responding to consultations, uh, meeting civil servants and ministers, lobbying parliament, working with other organisations, uh, campaigning on issues, an example of campaigning is our long-standing campaign for an opt-out system for organ donation, such as has been introduced in Wales. We would like to see it introduced in the other three countries of the UK. So finally, for those of you who are in practice, um, what can the department do to support you? I've mentioned the advice service. I've mentioned the guidance. Those are two of the books, those two little coloured um, rectangles. Uh, the orange one is Medical Ethics Today, now in its third edition, and the um, uh, pink purple one is um, Everyday Medical Ethics, which derives from uh, the uh, bigger book, but particularly focuses on um, those areas where we get the most inquiries, which are um, about uh, confidentiality, consent and capacity. Those are just some screenshots of uh, the website uh, and uh, of one of the toolkits, the toolkit for medical students on ethics. And that's how you can get in touch with the uh, department if you uh, have an inquiry, uh, have an issue on which you'd like advice. And that's how you get in touch with me. Uh, that's my email address and one of my Twitter accounts. So, um, thank you very much. <laughs> Expecting you might have some questions. <laughs> I must ask you a question. 
bias class. That's an entirely new one to me. Isn't it? I mean, well, I've, I've, ne I've never watched a film called Dallas Buyers Club, but I gather that this is what it's about. Uh, buyers clubs essentially are <coughs> groupings, uh, groups of patients who club together in order to access uh, medication that is not readily available um, on the NHS. Uh, an example, for instance, is in relation to uh, hepatitis C treatment. And so they are a way of um, uh, getting uh, high quality medication supplied to patients who need it uh, or who might benefit from it uh, in a way that sort of bypasses the system and certainly some of the buyers clubs are um, uh, instigating quality control to make quite sure that what they are being if you like the middle people in the supply chain uh, that what's being supplied is what it ought to be so it's a, it, it, it's an it, we had an interesting discussion um, the conclusion was that the committee actually didn't want to take a stance uh, on, on this uh, but there were a couple of examples and I've forgotten what the other one was where certainly I could see a um, you know, the, the public good would come out of the concept because people would more readily be able to access um, uh, medication that will benefit them that they couldn't easily get at the moment because uh, it hadn't been approved by NICE or whatever. That was a piece of totally new information for me. Um, questions from the floor? Thank you very much for a fascinating talk and I will retire the for this. Um, in view of the fact that almost certainly Donald Trump and possibly Hillary Clinton have had their email sites um, hacked by somebody in the, Soviet, in the Russian Federation, how confident are you that the National Health Service safe haven also might not be hacked or fished by other forces? I'm not at all confident. Um, uh, earlier this week, uh, I, uh, along with my predecessor as chair of the Ethics Committee, um, Tony Calland, who's an expert in information governance, and a Liverpool graduate indeed, in the same year as Jim Johnson and Tis North, um, and a year above D Machin. Um, but uh, yes, Tony Calland and I, but more importantly, Mark Porter, who's the chair of BMA Council, met uh, Jeremy Hunt and Nicola Blackwood, who's one of the junior ministers, <laughs> on these three confidentiality issues um, earlier this week. And I must say, it was uh, it was a productive meeting, um, and I think we made some progress. Um, but in our pre-meeting, <coughs> Uh, we were surmising about whether we should raise the issue of politicians' health records being extracted from uh, NHS Digital um, to put the frighteners on the ministers um, in the event we chose not to go down that path. But I think what you're suggesting is extremely um, <coughs> realistic as a possibility. I mean, um, you know, only this week we've seen the uh, charging of uh, Russians and Kazakhs uh, for um, a, an enormous data breach of Yahoo. Um, uh, we uh, have pretty strong evidence, uh, I think, that uh, there was Russian involvement in the US election. Um, uh, we have um, uh, WikiLeaks um, 
seemingly having having no sort of filter in their uh, procedures that they seem to just you know publish everything that they lay their hands on without thinking about the risks and threats of that. It can't be back. No, that's right. Um, and you know, I think for many people, the sharing of information is perceived as being a good thing in the sense that it can uh, aid our clinical care. Um, if we're admitted uh, unconscious to an accident and emergency department, it can uh, improve our care there. Um, and that anonymized aggregated data can be of enormous benefit for public health and for medical research. So for many of us, I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't worry me uh, if you could read my medical records. Uh, and I suspect that for a lot of people, um, uh, it, it wouldn't be an issue. But for hundreds of thousands or millions of people, it is an issue because they've got extremely sensitive things in their records that they would be terrified of coming into the public domain. And you're absolutely right to say once it's out there, it, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Um, it, it will be available on a website somewhere that can be uh, hacked into again. You know, however much you, you sort of try and wall off the leak that's happened, it, it, it can't be undone. And so I, I think it is very frightening. Um, uh, and uh, that's why um, safeguards have to be built in. But hackers seem to be so clever that um, uh, I'm not confident that um, uh, those sort of leaks can be prevented. And, and so that's why people um, very sensibly uh, may wish to exercise the choices they're given. <clears throat> and uh, it, it, it would be unfair to go into details, but I think that the government and Dame Fiona Caldicott are interested in giving people more choices rather than taking choices away from them. Um, uh, so that people can uh, say, I, I don't want to share. Thank you. Uh, you did mention uh, forensic medicine is an area where there can be conflict of protecting confidentiality. And um, in the Sexual Assault Feral Centre, one of the issues very much is that there's no PEP, um, prophylaxis, uh, HIV, when quite often, I have to say, Mersac police are very good at um, detaining a person who is alleged to have committed the offence. I'm uh, just interested in the conflict between um, the need for the victim to know whether they need that protection and the alleged offender's right not to share that particular piece of information. Um, I think that's an issue that we face quite frequently. There are two things that I'll touch on, and if I've if I've misunderstood the question, please please come back to me. Um, the uh, BMA has been very concerned about the situation of needle stick injuries when uh, somebody is unconscious and uh, what should happen in uh, that instance and has produced very detailed guidance um, last year about that situation uh, and it's different in England and Wales from in Scotland um, uh, because the law is different <clears throat> but is essentially in relation to that situation if the patient is uh, likely to become conscious again uh, and able to uh, give information or to uh, give consent um, uh, pretty soon, then uh, no special measures are um, required. But if prolonged unconsciousness is, is likely, then um, uh, the 
legal advice we have had is that because most people would want to help doctors and nurses in that situation, that uh, a broad interpretation of best interests would include um, uh, finding out the confidential information and doing testing. Um, obviously, uh, in the situation you're talking about of offenders and, and, and their uh, confidentiality, um, that's not that's not the same issue because it's clear if they are conscious of withholding their consent that they are entitled to do that. Uh, and so um, that's not a situation where their confidentiality can be breached or where they can be tested against their will. Um, a, a separate issue that I just wanted to touch on, and I know this isn't what you were asking about, but is to do with uh, doctors working in uh, forensic medicine and custodial settings, having uh, dual loyalties, <laughs> a loyalty to the individual patient, but also to the institution or to the employer. And um, it, it's a very complex area. It's an area that I've spoken on at a, a, a number of conferences and it's an area that the BMA has got detailed guidance on uh, how to resolve those issues. But essentially, even in, for doctors who work in custodial settings, um, GMC obligations obviously still apply and the patient is their first concern rather than the institution. But I realise that, sorry, that's a, a, a separate issue. It isn't the one that I, that you were asking about. Have I answered your question or have I missed the point? And is is your default position effectively that if you if if for whatever reason you can't find out the information that you just go ahead and administer prophylaxis? If a doctor has a medical ethical problem, he can approach either the BMA or his defence union. Given that the objectives of the two organisations, although they do overlap, basically, or a different, does the advice given ever differ in a substantial way between the two organisations? The simple answer is yes. Um, uh, Derek and I were at a meeting of BMA Council uh, yesterday where we changed the remit of the Medical Ethics Committee uh, to something that's closer to what we actually do. And in the old remit, there was emphasis on liaising with the medical defence organisations and in fact, we do that very rarely. Um, we li liaise with an enormous number of other um, uh, organisations, um, but we have relatively little contact with the medical defence organisations. The reason that I say their um, uh, guidance may differ is that I think they tend to be more cautious. I mean, I wouldn't wish you to think that the BMA was giving risky advice, but it, but because, as you point out, the purpose of the medical defence organisation, it, its raison d'etre is different from the BMA's. 
Um, I think there are differences on occasions in the advice that's given. I can't think of an example offhand, but what I would say is that I think that the BMA will spend a lot more time horizon scanning and looking at issue, looking at emerging issues. For example, um, the, there are um, a, a couple that Derek's mentioned, the Buyers Club one, for instance, and also the issue of uh, mitochondria and the license that's been given to uh, Newcastle uh, this week to uh, uh, implement that in a clinical setting. Uh, they, we, we were talking about that issue years ago and have had three extensive debates about that issue. Um, so we are we're sort of trying to anticipate issues like you know, the implications of whole genome sequencing being widely available and so on. Whereas I think the medical defense organizations are much more looking at situations that arise uh, now rather than sort of trying to future proof um, but I can't think of I, I can't think of an example it's just my my feeling is that the, there will be occasions where the advice differs uh, I'll tell you the, the organization where we very rarely have a difference of view uh, and that's the General Medical Council um, with whom we work very closely uh, and um, although you know, there, are, there are nuances of difference there, by and large we uh, think very similarly to uh, the GMC on <coughs> ethical issues. I don't know if that's a, a reassurance or a frightener. But, um... Thank you John. Let's call upon John Ridgehold to give the vote of thanks. Thank you Derek. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always nice to put a face behind the name and the photograph. I'm still one of those who reads the BNA. That's on a BNJ, although I, I retired my wife sometimes sat my wrist for still doing so. Um, um, now I've reached the age when I'm more likely to use rather than implement the services of the NHS. And I do have my worries sometimes when you read about casualty departments, you know, the gathering of data, but um, it's very reassuring to me to know that there are people like you, John, who are in this ethics committee. And I have to say that I too am guilty of forgetting that the BNA does have this dual role of not only representing doctors' primary interests, and also the ethics of the profession. And uh, I think John touched upon it. We do sometimes get a bit confused. We look to our own colleges, we look to the GMC, we look to the BMA we, uh, as to who is our source of knowledge. But um, it's very good that we now, we, you know, to have heard what you said, you've given us a, a very extensive analysis of the problems. And I would like to thank you on behalf of everyone here, not only for giving you this talk tonight, um, and very sorry to be young and might say particularly to be in the BMA and to you know to, to realize that they does have this ethical function. And thank you very much, obviously, for your work within it as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, John.